Your Guide to Butternut Squash A vine-growing winter squash, butternut has a sweet and nutty taste that's similar to pumpkin. It makes tasty soups and is delicious when roasted. Butternut squash is also packed with vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and antioxidants. Before we get started, let's learn a little bit about butternut squash. Vining type. Butternut squash is a vining type, which is a plant that has trailing or climbing stems or runners. Its vines need additional support, like a trellis or fence, in order to grow properly. Hybrid variety. The offspring of two plants from different breeds, varieties, or species. Open pollinated. A plant that has been pollinated by wind, insects, birds, humans, or by another natural source. Monoecious, separate male and female flowers that are on the same plant. For fruit production, pollen from the male flowers must be transferred to the female flower, mainly by insect pollinators. That's why it's very important to protect these beneficial insects. These are just some of the many butternut squash varieties. Butterbush, this early variety grows in a bush habit producing one to two pound fruit. Early butternut, a hybrid All-America selection winner. It's early, medium in size, and has a high yield. Panka, this variety is extra early, has a small seed cavity, and stores well. Ultra, the largest fruit of this variety can be six to 10 pounds. It's also got a good leaf canopy. Zenith a hybrid variety that's smooth with attractive fruit and a high yield. Butternut squash can either be directly sowed or grown as a transplant. Directly sowing. Sow your squash seeds about one inch, two centimeters deep. You'll want to sow three seeds in each spot and then thin to the strongest plant. Give your butternut squash some extra room by spacing them a minimum of 36 to 48 inches, 90 to 120 centimeters apart, in rows that are 48 to 72 inches, 120 to 180 centimeters apart. Their ideal soil pH is between 6.0 to 6.8, and they typically take about 10 to 14 days to germinate. Transplanting. Squash can be transplanted when the plants are young, 15 to 20 days old, and have been started in containers. Keep in mind that vine crop transplants won't do very well if the plants are too large. To start your transplants, place two seeds in a three to four inch, seven to 10 centimeter deep pot in late March, early April. Then set up protective row covers as soon as you're done planting. In this section, we'll tell you everything you need to know about thinning, weeding, watering, and pollination. We'll also talk fertilizer and mulch, transplanting, companion planting, and your growing structure options. Thinning. You'll want to thin from three plants per hill to one, which will avoid overcrowding your squash. That way they have lots of space to grow with enough air circulation between them. Weeding. Make sure you keep weeds under control during your squash's growing season. Weeds compete with plants for water, space, and nutrients. So either cultivate often or use a mulch to prevent weed seeds from germinating. Water. Squash needs lots of moisture to produce high yields of quality fruit. Typically about one inch of water is needed each week during their fruit production. In sandy soils, higher amounts of water might also be needed, along with more frequent watering. For example, three quarters of an inch of water roughly twice a week. Pollination. Squash has both male and female flowers that grow on the same plant. Male flowers form first, followed by the females, which can be identified as having undeveloped fruit at their base. Pollination is always necessary for winter squash, with pollen being transferred from male to female flowers by bees, avoid using any insecticides on your squash plants because the chemicals can harm these pollinating bees, which wouldn't be good for your squash. Trellis. 
Squash vines are sprawling and need plenty of space to grow, so they can be trained to grow on a trellis or fence. These structures keep the stems and vines from snapping, which could result in disease or even death. Blossoms. As your seedlings grow, remove any blossoms as they bloom. This will help encourage your plant to grow more squash. As the buds of your squash start to grow, be sure to place a piece of wood under them or just take care to move them so that rot doesn't happen. Keep in mind that any contact with the wet ground for a prolonged period of time can encourage rot diseases. Fertilizer. Use one cup of a complete organic fertilizer, working it into the soil beneath each plant. For the best yields, you can also incorporate some compost or well-rotted manure before planting. Fertilize your garden by scattering two pounds of a 10 to 10 to 10 fertilizer per 100 square feet of garden, incorporating it into the soil. If you're planting transplants, then you'll want to apply a transplant fertilizer starter when you plant. Mix one tablespoon of a soluble fertilizer that's high in phosphorus, 10 to 20 to 10, into a gallon of water. Then apply one cup of solution to each plant. Mulch. Squash plants have a shallow root system, so mulches help retain soil moisture while keeping soil temperature even. Plastic mulch and fabric row covers, AG19 grade, can help your plants get established while repelling insect pests during the seedling stage. Transplanting Best Practices Before you plant, you'll want to harden off your seedlings first, starting about four to seven days before you're ready to plant. Get your seedlings used to the outdoor conditions by setting them outside for a few hours each day, keeping them sheltered from the elements at first. This will reduce their shock and stress from transplanting. Once they've been hardened off, create a mound that's at least three inches tall and a minimum of three times the width of the roots. Squash can be transplanted when the plants are young, 15 to 20 days old, and have been started in containers. Be sure to handle your transplants gently and avoid disturbing their roots. Companion plants do's and don'ts. Do's, beans, corn, cucumbers, Icicle radishes, melon, mint, onions, and pumpkin are all great companion vegetables for your squash. If you're looking for some helpers with your butternut squash, borage deters worms while improving growth and flavor. Marigolds deter beetles, and oregano provides some general pest protection. Dill might also help repel squash bugs, which are pests that kill your squash's vines. Don'ts. Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collard, kale, potatoes, Swiss chard, kohlrabi, and sweet potatoes should be avoided near your butternut squash. Growing structure options. Raised beds. Choose a sunny spot and prepare three foot wide planting hills within wide rows. You can also position these hills along your garden's edge, leaving about five to six feet between hills. Loosen the soil to at least 12 inches deep. Then, thoroughly mix in a two inch layer of mature compost, as well as a light application of balanced organic fertilizer. Finally, be sure to give them a nice drink of water. Containers. This option will work as long as your containers have plenty of drainage holes and lots of room. As a rule of thumb, don't use a container that's any less than five gallons in size for two to three seedlings. During the growing season, feed your plants lightly to make up for the lack of nutrients in the potting soil. Potential pests and their solutions. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations. 
But if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days for about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Army worms. Army worms are green, reddish, or black caterpillars that heavily feed on the leaves of plants turning them into skeleton leaves that are filled with lots of irregular or circular shaped holes. These pests are most active in the early morning and the late evening, which are the best times to check for damage. Here's what to do. You can use natural enemies like wasps and flies to help keep army worms in check. Also, if you're using insecticides, it's best to do so in the twilight hours. This is when those insecticides will be the most effective. It's also important to control the growth of weeds because they serve as cover for armyworms. Finally, you can simply hand pick any armyworms off the plants. Cucumber beetle. Brightly colored pests with either a green yellow body with black spots or alternating black and yellow stripes. Typically, the adults will feed on leaves Meanwhile, its larvae will burrow into the roots and stems. Cucumber beetles can then stunt the growth of seedlings and cause damage to a plant's leaves and stems. Eventually, plants will wilt and die. Here's what to do. Floating row covers can be used to protect plants from cucumber beetle damage, but these row covers will need to be removed once the plants are flowering to allow bees to pollinate. Applying kaolin clay can also be an effective solution against small numbers of beetles. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it, which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day, and they prey more on nutrients plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. Hand pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, remove plant residue to help reduce egg laying sites and get rid of weeds, which can host young cutworm larvae. Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg laying. As well, try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier, which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface. And natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth, essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Flea beetles. 
small beetles that are either black, a blue color, bronze, gray, or sometimes striped. Flea beetles jump when they're disturbed, and they also shimmer in the light. Flea beetles feed on leaves and seedlings, and the damage from their feeding habits can stunt a plant's growth, reduce yields, spread diseases, or kill seedlings off entirely. Young plants are especially vulnerable, while older plants can survive an infestation much better. Here's what to do. Use a lightweight floating row cover at the beginning of the season to prevent flea beetles from becoming an issue. There's also a homemade spray that uses two cups of rubbing alcohol, five cups of water, and one tablespoon of liquid soap that can work to repel these bugs. Test out this mixture on a single leaf first. Let it sit overnight, then spray the rest of the plant if there aren't any side effects. Dusting plants with plain talcum powder can also help, as well as using white sticky traps to capture these pests as they jump. As well, weeds attract and shelter flea beetles, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. Insecticides might help for about a week, but they'll need to be reapplied, and adding a layer of mulch is yet another option. Be sure to practice crop rotation and plant seeds early to give them lots of time to establish themselves before the beetles become a problem. Mature plants are less susceptible to damage, so make sure to protect more vulnerable seedlings. Squash bugs. These pests cause leaves to turn speckled, yellow, and brown. Plants that are affected by squash bugs will wilt, the plant's runners will die back, and the squash fruit can either become spotted or it dies off entirely. Here's what to do. Destroy all crop residue as soon as possible, either after harvest or after a plant dies. Also, apply row covers when planting and use insecticidal soap. White flies. These pests are known for their white bodies and wings and for hanging out on the undersides of leaves. They feed on the leaves of a plant, causing damage that makes the plant susceptible to other diseases. These pesky flies will typically group together on the undersides of leaves, and then the flies will fly up when disturbed. Here's what to do. Remove any affected leaves, or the whole plant, if it's severely infested. Introduce beneficial insects, like ladybugs, spiders, lacewing larvae and dragonflies into the garden. Use yellow sticky traps and apply insecticidal soaps or oils. Keep in mind that these oils, like neem oil, might reduce white fly numbers, but they won't eliminate them entirely. Potential diseases and their solutions. Alternaria leaf blight. This fungus loves warm and wet conditions causing brown spots with yellow edges to appear on the leaves, usually the oldest leaves first of a crop. The center of these lesions will also develop gray to brown soft fungal mold, eventually drying out and giving leaves a shot hole appearance. As the disease progresses, leaves will begin to curl and eventually will die and drop from the plant. This disease is common in growing areas with high temperatures and frequent rainfall. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease-resistant seeds when possible, and water plants from below to avoid having soil splash up onto the lower leaves of the plants. It's also helpful to water plants in the morning so that they have time to dry out during the day. In addition to watering plants from below, it's also helpful to provide a well-ventilated cover for the plants to protect the plants from rain. Be sure to clean any equipment between uses to prevent the spread of bacteria. And do not prune or handle plants when those plants are wet. As well, establish a crop rotation and stick to it. If there are any blighty leaves present, usually on the bottom of the plant closest to the soil, remove and destroy them. Finally, plant leaves can be sprayed with a baking soda solution, one tablespoon baking soda, 2.5 tablespoons of vegetable oil, 
and one teaspoon of liquid soap to one gallon of water. Or neem oil. Just take care not to use neem oil when pollinating insects, like bees or other beneficial insects are present. Spray only a few leaves to start, then check for a reaction before applying every two weeks. Circospora leaf spot. Small spots with light to tan centers will first appear on the older leaves of plants. As the disease progresses, the centers of these lesions might become brittle and could possibly crack, while older infected leaves can yellow and die. When exposed to high humidity, the lesions will appear fuzzy. Here's what to do. To control the spread of Circospora leaf spot, avoid planting susceptible crops within 100 yards of a previously infected spot. Till any infected crops to bury them, as well as fungal residue, which will prevent the disease from staying in the soil and carrying over into future plantings. However, if any plants are badly infected, pull them out, then hot compost those diseased plants, a method that involves burning compost. It's also best to practice crop rotation so that the soil can be protected, which helps prevent continuous disease and pest outbreaks. Also, apply a dense organic mulch like grass clippings or compost around plants, then water around their base, not overhead. It can also be helpful to spray plants with a baking soda solution, one tablespoon of baking soda, 2.5 tablespoons of vegetable oil, and a teaspoon of liquid soap to one gallon of water. Keep in mind that baking soda might burn some plant leaves, so it's best to spray one or two leaves first and then check for a reaction before applying every two weeks. Neem oil can also be sprayed on plants, but just make sure not to use it when pollinating insects, like bees and other beneficial insects are around the garden. As well, sulfur sprays or copper-based fungicides can be applied weekly at the first sign of this disease to prevent the disease's spread. These organic fungicides will not kill leaf spot entirely, but they will prevent the fungal spores from germinating and spreading. Downy mildew. This fungal disease thrives in cool, humid climates. At first, downy mildew causes leaves to turn yellow, typically starting from the main vein, then spreading outward. Fungal spores that are grayish, purple, fuzzy spots will then grow on the undersides of leaves, Downy mildew typically affects young, tender leaves, and severe infections can also cause curled and distorted leaves. Sometimes those affected leaves can then become dehydrated and then drop from the plant entirely. When seedlings are affected, their growth is stunted, and downy mildew can also reduce crop yields while acting as an entry point for other diseases. When older plants are affected, in addition to the lesions they get, they will also seem more rigid and narrow as compared to healthy plants. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice good crop rotation. Ensure good air circulation around plants and water plants early in the morning. This last tip gives the plants enough time to dry out during the day, making those plants less vulnerable to infection. Downy mildew is usually spread when leaves are wet for too long, so it also helps to avoid overhead watering. As well, be sure to keep weeds from growing. Once plants have downy mildew, the best thing to try is to eliminate moisture and humidity around the infected plants. If possible, try to improve their air circulation through selective pruning. In general, downy mildew normally clears itself up in an outdoor garden once the weather warms up, since it doesn't do well in warm temperatures. Also, if there are any infected plants, be sure to remove all crop remains after harvest to avoid reinfection, since this fungus can survive in crop residue. Keep in mind too that downy mildew is much easier to control when a plant's leaves and fruit are kept protected by a copper spray. Copper treatments can begin two weeks before the disease normally appears and when a long period of wet weather is in store. 
Proper treatments can also start when the disease first appears. Then those treatments can be repeated at seven to 10 day intervals for as long as the treatments are needed. Powdery mildew. Small white patches will appear on the upper and lower leaf surfaces, which might also show some purple blotching. Patches often come together to form a dense powdery layer, coating the leaves and causing the leaves to curl inward. In some cases, eventually the leaves will drop from the plant. Typically, the white patches start on the older leaves and then eventually spread to other plant parts. Powdery mildew is brought on by high humidity and moderate temperatures, 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, or 16 to 27 degrees Celsius, with symptoms becoming most severe in shaded areas. As well, this disease often acts as an entry point for other pests and diseases. Here's what to do. First, rotate crops so that members of the same family aren't planted in the same spot year after year. In general, a three-year rotation is a good place to start. Plant disease-resistant varieties when possible, and then provide good air circulation by not crowding the plants and by eliminating weeds. Water plants in the morning to give them enough time to dry out, taking care not to get the plant's leaves wet. Consider spraying infected plants with certain protectant, preventative fungicides. Sulfur, lime sulfur, neem oil, and potassium bicarbonate are all effective, but these remedies will work best when they are used before the infection happens or when signs of the disease are first spotted. Instead of chemical fungicides, plants can also be sprayed with a bicarbonate solution by simply mixing one teaspoon of baking soda in one quart of water. Make sure to spray the plants thoroughly since the solution will only kill fungi that it comes into contact with. Also, potassium bicarbonate, which is similar to baking soda, can actually eliminate powdery mildew once it's there and does the job fairly quickly. As well, after the growing season, make sure to dispose of any infected leaves or fruit. Once plants are heavily infected with powdery mildew, it's difficult to get rid of the disease, so focus on preventing it from spreading to other plants. Blossom end rot. When plants are affected with this disease, light brown spots will first appear at the bottom of the fruit, and those fruits will often get invaded by another black mold. As the fruit grows, the spots grow bigger, turning into dark, leathery lesions that are sunken into the fruit. Here's what to do. Maintain consistent watering and keep the soil evenly moist. Also, add mulch to help the plants retain water. Straw or black plastic will do the trick. Excess nitrogen also causes blossom end rot on crops because the excess nitrogen blocks the absorption of calcium. As a result, it's best to avoid high nitrogen fertilizers as well as ammonia fertilizers like fresh manure. If a plant is already showing signs of end rot in the plant's early fruiting phase, calcium may need to be added into the soil. Keep in mind though that calcium isn't taken in well by the leaves, so avoid using a foliar spray. Calcium needs to go directly to the roots, so calcium carbonate tablets, or anti-acid tablets like Tums, can be placed into the soil at the base of the plant. Cucurbit Yellow Stunting Disorder Virus When plants are affected with this virus, yellow to brown spots will typically appear first, which eventually leads to severe yellowing of the plant. Infected leaves might roll upward and become brittle, while the infected plant can appear stunted. Here's what to do. Since this disease is mainly spread by white flies, it's important to control white fly numbers. As well, maintain healthy and vigorous plants. When possible, plant recommended varieties and monitor the garden for any unusual symptoms as those symptoms happen. Keep the garden area clear of weeds too, because weeds can harbor pesky insects. Choosing separate areas for early and late plantings can also help to minimize the severity of this disease in those late plantings. 
fusarium, crown, and foot rot. The wilting of leaves eventually progresses to the wilting of the entire plant, and that plant will then die within a few days. When an infected plant is uprooted, there will be a distinct brown rot on the plant's crown and roots. As well, plants will break easily below the soil line. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Fusarium thrives in hot temperatures when the soil moisture is low. So because of this, make sure to keep the soil evenly moist, especially in the hottest months of the season. Try to do so without flooding the garden, because too much water can create a breeding ground for other diseases and pests. Solarizing any affected soil can also help to kill off this fungus. Simply cover the affected soil with black plastic and leave it undisturbed during the warm season. The sun, along with the plastic, will then heat up the soil, killing the fungus in the process. Harvesting. Butternut squash is ready for harvest when the outside of the rind has turned a light tan to golden yellow. That surface will then be difficult to pierce with your thumbnail, and the fruit will weigh between two to five pounds. Cut the stem about one to two inches from the fruit. Make sure to harvest all mature fruits before hard frosts are set to arrive. Storage. Store your butternut squash in a dry location that has a temperature between 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 12 to 15 degrees Celsius. When stored under these conditions, your squash will keep for several months.